Uh, thanks for that great introduction. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks for the great introduction and thanks to the organizers for having me here today. Um, I, before this started, I just took a selfie outside the library. And I sent it to my mom. I was like, oh, mom, about to give a paper in Germany. And she was like, oh, good luck. Why does your face look so fat? So, <laughs> gotta love moms. Uh, yeah, um, I've, if you've noticed, I've, I've tweaked my title slightly uh, to put a pun in because I like dad jokes. Don't have any children, but when I do, I'll have the personality and the jokes for it. Um, and I've also changed my, my paper today slightly from the abstract I sent in. So some of the ideas I'm proposing today uh, will be published in an article in the next issue of a journal called Word and Text. So today I've, I've tried to zoom in instead more on um, some of the theoretical uh, implications and kind of ideas that I'm batting around and sort of like trying to maneuver. So, yeah, um, the ideas that I'm going to be talking about today represent uh, my, I guess, evolving efforts to think about narrativity and poeticity, and it's something that I'm grappling with and working through. So I appreciate the chance to be here today uh, to share this with all of you guys. And this was a topic uh, which was in large part catalyzed by this Warren McHill article. I believe it was published in 2009, 2008, um, so about 10 years ago. And this was the start of my interest in thinking about narrative theory and poetry. So. Um, in this article, McHill, Brian McHill made this observation. Uh, he said that, oh, it's kind of strange that contemporary narrative theory is mostly silent about poetry. Uh, over the last few days in the conference, we've heard uh, many, many different uh, media forms uh, and how they intersect with narrativity. We've talked about graphic novels or comics. We've talked about video games. We've talked about databases. And we've uh, looked at some films as well. Uh, and McHale acknowledges that all these things have come into the fray of narrative theory, but he also says it's kind of strange that no one's thinking about poetry when we think, uh, when in fact, for most of human history, narratives were recorded in the form of verse. And he argues that even when poetry is addressed, uh, and he looks at the work of some of his colleagues like Peter Hune or his Ohio or his, his OSU uh, department mate James Phelan. He says that they, largely, they are largely examined as de facto prose fictions, uh, where the poetic form is optional and supplementary. So in his words, the poetry drops out of the equation, and we just kind of look at them uh, for the story. Uh, so he is proposing that instead of doing that, we try to get an understanding of what makes poetry poetry, uh, the poeticity of it, he calls it. And in an effort to look for a definition of poetry or poeticity, he turns to this. Uh, short excerpt from the American poet Rachel Blau de Plessy. And I think it's worth replicating it in full, but I've highlighted some of the more salient parts so we can pay attention to it. So de Plessy says that poetry is the kind of writing which is articulated in sequence gapped lines and meanings are created by occurring in bounded units precisely chosen in relation to chosen pauses or silences. So there's this idea that boundaries and segments in poetry, segments of language are created through the use of negative space, the very precise use of negative space. And it's this use of negative space that allows for a kind of intricate interplay uh, between stanzas, between broken lines. Uh, this, we get this, sort of, this sense of harmony, this almost musical sense of uh, counterpoint that happens. So she proposes that segmentivity is the underlying characteristic of poetry as a genre. And, uh, some people might have various definitions of poetry, but for today's discussion, I'm going to be working with this one, um, especially as we think about narrativity later on. So uh, basically, as I've said earlier, McHill is saying that there's a kind of hermeneutical failure uh, of narrative theorists when we look at poetry. Basically, we're not looking at them at poetry. We're trying to take the story out of it. And it's kind of, it kind of parallels the story narrative discourse uh, dynamic that we know from classical narratology. Uh, we're just ignoring the narrative discourse, he says, and we're just looking at the story, extracting the events out and trying to read that instead of what the poetry actually is. So he kind of argues that if we just add poeticity 
back into the equation, then we get these like accurate, good readings of poetry as narratives. Uh, and I'm slightly uh, more skeptical because uh, in, in my in, in my engagement with this, I've I seem to I, I think that the, the problems stem from deeper roots, uh, and that actually the conceptual structures underlying narratology. Uh, complicate or make it awkward for us to think about poetry. And to illustrate why, I'm just going to be zooming in on one particular example, which is an exchange between Monica Fludenik, don't know if I say that right, and uh, Ian Alba around the time that uh, Fludenik was proposing her model of narratology, uh, natural narratology. So um, just for the sake of getting some momentum here, I'm going to recapitulate uh, what Fludenik was trying to do. Uh, so, in 1996, she was aiming to redefine narrativity. Flutenik uh, argued that classical narratology was too beholden to structuralist modes, beholden to binary oppositions. Uh, so, previous modes of narrativity proposed either eventfulness, uh, a, a something happening, like the king died, or sequentiality, so two things happening, one after the other, the king died and the queen died or explicated causality, the king died and then the queen died of grief. And so these were kind of like notions of narrativity that were fundamental criteria for, for narration. Uh, and we've heard various versions of narrativity being proposed at this conference. Uh, I think the one that's sort of most common here is the idea of sequential or causal sequentiality. That's the one that most people seem to be working with. Uh, and just as, just as a side note, the idea that the king died and then the queen died of grief, um, so it's been rebutted by Chapman saying that like, oh, we don't actually need to say the queen died of grief because our brains automatically do the work of filling in uh, the reasons. It's something that's just kind of fundamental to human reasoning. And I think he pretty much won because anytime uh, Foster's idea of the king died and the queen died of grief gets cited, Chapman gets cited along him. So everyone from Herman to... Uh, Abbott talks about Chapman rather than Foster. So, uh, so against those notions of narrativity, uh, so Danik's proposing what she terms instead mediated human experientiality as the bedrock of narrative. So basically she's suggesting that um, it's not quite enough for us just to have events in sequence. Uh, we need to sort of like ground it in some notion of what it's like to be human, some first person, or not first person, but some interiority, some anthropomorphic perspective. Uh, she talks about the, the capacity for quasi-mimetic evocation of real life experience that constitutes narrativity at large. So what this means is you could basically take uh, the idea of sequentiality out of the equation and still be left with something of narrativity. You could have a plotless narrative. Um, and because she wants to focus on how we experience the text and how the phenomenological processes of reading are, uh, she doesn't believe that there's an essential out there notion of narrativity. She wants to focus on how readers construct the text instead. Uh, which means that natural narratology uh, or the experientiality model of narrativity uh, radically widens the parameters for, for what we consider to be narrative. And it's a very ambitious scope. It spans all the way from conversational narratives to medieval verse narratives to postmodernist literature. And um, incidentally, at this conference, I think, under Flutenic's model, um, Lucas Wilde's uh, pre narrative characters would also be considered as narrative. They might be without plot, but they're still narrative because they have human experientiality. So, uh, in, an, in a bit to kind of like test out Flutenic's model, uh, Alba tries to apply it to Beckett's famously incomprehensible uh, short story, Lastness. And uh, Fludenik suggests that one of the ways that experientiality could be applied to postmodernist texts that seem otherwise dissonant or disparate is that we could narrativize all the elements of the text as uh, being kind of reflecting or uh, re representing the consciousness of uh, mental illness or mental dissonance. So with that in mind, Albert tries to read lessness as a mimicry of the experiential consciousness of the person in a state of shock or a madman. So here I've got a short excerpt from lessness in case you guys haven't read it. So we kind of see what Albert's working with. 
And uh, as you can see, it's a very, very difficult text to try to make sense of. Um, syntactically, in this sort of like classic backward fashion, it doesn't quite make sense. You don't really get like uh, sentences that, that make sense. Uh, it's very hard to find a focal point, a focalizing point. It's very hard to, to tell where or who is, being, is perceiving the events over here. It's very hard to talk about a sense of uh, causal sequentiality. The one kind of like event we could think of is he will curse God again as in the blessed day's face to the open sky, the passing deluge. Uh, what we do get is that there is a very persistent sense of rhythm and there is a very persistent sense of uh, segmentation going on. The lines are all roughly equal, equal lengths. So Alba grapples with this and he tries to read uh, the text a certain way through natural narratology. But basically, he eventually judges his reading unsuccessful. And the reason he does this here, I think, is, uh, is the rub. Uh, he, he's, in his reading, he finds that lessness cannot be narrativized through natural narratology at the end because it lacks a deitic locus of utterance where first-person narrative might be perceived. In other words, he can't find a human being in there. And this is where, for me, it starts to get very interesting because having concluded that lessness does not qualify as narrative, he says that well, in that case, lessness has to exist at the boundary between the genres of narrative and lyric. Um, and this is where my interest is peaked because I work with, a lot with uh, the lyric subject. And I think in our contemporary usage, we tend to use the term lyric and poetry interchangeably, which is understandable uh, because pretty much any time today in the 21st century we talk about poetry, we are talking about lyric poetry. And of course, we might think of uh, experimental writers, like the language writers or conceptual writers. Um, but in the popular kind of imagination, lyric poetry is poetry. Uh, and also, by and large, when uh, theorists talk about poetry, they do mean lyric poetry. Uh, but in, just for the sake of this argument today, I'm going to be working for a much more granular definition of lyric. Uh, and in part, this is because Fludernik herself takes great pains to distinguish between medieval verse and lyric poetry. In, uh, in her book, she, takes, she exhaustingly kind of demonstrates how the stanzas and the rhyme schemes of uh, medieval English verse create the narrative structure of those stories that they're telling. Which is why it's very strange later on that she uh, concludes that like, at the point where we can no longer find a human being in the text, where we can't narrativize it as being of a human consciousness, that's where it becomes poetry. And what she really means here, it's, it's kind of unclear to me. Uh, but Albert, in his writing, does use the term lyric and poetry interchangeably. And I'm not not quite sure what's going on, but it seems to me that basically what's happened is that for them, lyric poetry becomes an, or poetry becomes an antonym for narrative. So they seem to regard uh, poetry as just sort of like the opposite signifier of narrative, whatever narrative isn't. But if it's still obviously literary, that has to be poetry. And I actually find that lastness would not qualify as a lyric and it would not qualify as a lyric for the exact same reasons that Alba disqualifies it from being narrative. Uh, the inability to find a human being in, in lessness means that we can't find all the hallmarks of a lyric subject or a lyric voice in poetry. There. So I'm thinking here of um, Dennis Donahue's idea that the lyric is a tradition where the poet mind, poet's mind communes with itself. Uh, so the poet has an interiority which the poem investigates. Now, of course, we're familiar with this sort of like a, a often quoted or parody definition by Wordsworth that uh, poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful emotions recollected in tranquility. And even when we're grappling with a definition like Jonathan Cullors, who says that uh, the lyric the lyric self doesn't exist, that when we read the lyric subject, it's just only necessary to imagine uh, a persona in the poem. It's, a, it's an interpretative device. Even in that case, uh, Carla would argue that it's a necessary fiction for the poem to be considered a lyric poem, that we do need kind of a placeholder, a deictic kind of a speaking placeholder in the poem for it to be thought of as a lyric. 
which means that Alba's inability to recuperate um, a human consciousness from lastness makes it very peculiar that he does, that he then goes on to relegate lastness as a lyric. Uh, and so this seems to be the kind of model of poeticity and narrativity that uh, both Alba and Flutonic are working with. And if we could sort of look here, uh, we've got narrativity to the right, uh, we've got poeticity to the left, and experimental writing kind of uh, exists somewhere in the middle in this liminal zone. Uh, and Alba says that, so in a realm of very experimental, in the realm of very experimental writing, uh, generic boundaries or generic classifications get erased. Uh, and also from Fodernik's own argument, the narrative genre merges with poetry when narrativity can no longer be recuperated by any means at all. When there is no narrative, then that's where we get poetry. So we get the sense that narrativity and poetry are kind of like interlocked in this mutual exclusivity. Uh, either you get one or you get the other, and this doesn't quite, they can't, when they do coexist, there's a kind of tension there that can't be resolved. And I find this unsatisfying because I think intuitively we think of various texts and we think of them as possessed of both poeticity and narrativity. Um, so I want to suggest here uh, just a very slight tweak to the way we imagine, uh, the way we position poeticity and narrativity together. I want to suggest that poeticity and narrativity are two lateral, non-contradictory non ways of organizing of or perceiving information that can and often do overlap significantly. In other words, let's think about poeticity and narrative as being on two axes on which uh, literature might be iterated. Uh, and we've earlier talked about the use of uh, negative space in poetry, how poetry could be organized according to chosen pauses or silence, according to Duplessis notion. Uh, and it is out of this uh, sense of chosen pauses or silence that we get poetic form, uh, either free verse or sort of like a regular meter, or even in prose poetry, they all sort of operate with this notion of musicality, this notion of segments that are created in poetry. Uh, and we also know that um, the, the model of narrativity that we work with in causal sequentiality also similarly operates through the use of negative space. Uh, I think on the first day in Dr. Jared Gardner's talk, we had this panel from uh, Scott McCloud talking about the gutter, and we see this sort of like uh, dramatic cut away from the knife just as it's about to sink in. Um, and at that moment, our brains step into the gap and they co-construct the narrative together with the author. Our brains fill in that action of the knife sinking in first, right? Uh, so in this instance, we, we get, get both kind of like similar information organized according to negative space. And I've heard it proposed that negative space in narrative and negative space in poetry behave completely differently. In poetry, negative space is meant to be foregrounded. We want to pay attention to the negative space to get a sense of the rhythms, the recurrences, the regularity or the irregularities of poetry, to get a sense of the music there. Whereas negative space in narratives just kind of like drive us forward. We keep jogging forward, we are trotting towards the end. We get a sense of momentum going. I'm not quite certain that negative space in poetry and narratives work differently. Rather, I want to suggest that poeticity in narratives and narrativity are not quite essential, but to return to Flutonic, poeticity and narrativity are ways of reading and that various devices and various uh, forms push us towards a certain way of reading. Uh, but I think it's equally likely and, and a practice that we do do quite often that we read something first as a narrative and then we go back and we read it for the rhythms, for the poetry. If I'm reading like uh, Beowulf and I get really carried away by the dragons and the sword fighting, I'm going to be reading it for the plot. But if I want to go back and read the language, then I could equally do that. And we kind of prime ourselves to recognize the negative spaces or to prime ourselves to recognize the same information differently depending on how we choose it. So, um, so of course, this is not quite universal. Uh, obviously, we can't do this with every single piece of literature. But so here we have an example of the kind of way that I'm just like the slight tweak I'm proposing to think about poeticity and narrativity instead, where poeticity is a certain axis and narrativity is a certain axis. Uh, 
And along this axis, we could think about different styles of writing. So, for example, something which is high in poeticity but low in narrativity might be uh, experimental language writing, Ron Silliman, Ray Armitrao, Charles Bernstein. Uh, or we might think about filmic tone poems, like uh, the films of uh, Tarkovsky. Something which is um, high in both poetry and narrativity might be uh, certain novels, modernist novels, Virginia Woolf's uh, The Waves, for instance, uh, Joyce or Beckett. Um, and we might also think about epic poetry, in which the, both the narrative and the sense of poetry is quite strong. Something which is high in narrativity but low in... My time is up. Just give me a while. <laughs> uh, high in narrativity but low in poeticity would be something like a pulp fiction novel, or maybe superhero movies, or uh, conversations, like uh, oral conversations. And then at the very end of the spectrum, with no poeticity or narrativity, we might get uh, anguish cries or involuntary noises like sneezing or coughing as expressions of human experience, but with a uh, not quite poetic or narrative. So in closing, I guess, I'm just sort of, uh, to, to return to the theme of this conference, I'm trying to think about what we talk about when we speak of liminality. What does it mean to say that things are betwixt, or things are betwixt? Do we mean that the two spaces that we try to imagine them are mutually exclusive? Uh, and I'm quite curious to see what the consensus or the lack of consensus here is. And consequently, how do we imagine borderlands? Do we imagine hard borders? Do we imagine tensions? Do we imagine a certain fluidity between uh, zones? And when we conceptualize the threshold, does it necessarily mean mutual exclusivity? Uh, are we doomed to default to binaries even when we're trying not to? Because uh, even to speak of binary versus non-binary is a binary. So I don't know, but I would appreciate the conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Samuel Caleb Lee. I'm from both UBC as well as NTU. And if you want to reach me, my email is down there. Thank you.